Well, good morning and welcome to South Point, where we're one church in multiple locations. I want to say good morning and give a shout out to our Lusby campus. Hey, everyone at Leonardtown, let's give our Lusby campus a little fist bump, a little fist bump out there. Yay, Lusby, we miss you. Good morning and welcome to Leonardtown. We're so glad that you're with us. My name is Matt. I'm part of the team. Hey, we have a little saying here at South Point. Um, we haven't said it in a while, but I want to say it specifically this morning as we continue in our series. And, and here's how it goes. We really don't care why you're here today. And here's why we don't care why you're you're here today because at South Point, we are a place where you can come as you are. But here's the good news. None of us have to stay that way. We also say, listen, it doesn't matter where you've been in life because there's even better news. God is not concerned about where you've been. God is more concerned about where you're going. And lastly, we say we don't care what's been done by you or to you because here's the greatest news to ever hit planet Earth. Your life, my life, our life does not have to be defined by our failures, our mistakes, or what was done to us. Instead, it can be defined by what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so this morning, we just want to welcome you to South Point Church, and you matter deeply to God. Hey, I brought with me something that I've had since, gosh, I was 17 or 18, and I don't know if you can read it out in the audience or if you can see it on the screens, um, but it's my old license plate. Matter of fact, this was one of my first license plates that I ever got, and it has the word set free. And there's a story behind this license plate, and so you just kind of have to hang on. I'm going to get to this and tell you a little bit about my license plate that says free. Um, but we're in week three of our series called What Keeps You Up at Night. And week one, here's what we discovered. Week one, we said, listen, the habit of worry, the habit of worrying harms us physically, relationally, and practically. And here's why we said this is so important. Listen, sometimes emotions or feelings are unavoidable. Sometimes we're going to have the emotion and the feeling of worry. Sometimes we're going to have the emotion and feeling of stress. Sometimes we're going to have the, um, the emotion and feeling of anxiety. And so we have to answer the question, are our emotions or feelings handling us or are we handling them? So if you miss week one, you can go back and catch up. And then week two, we talked about this. We said, listen, chasing more often leads to less peace. And last week we talked about, listen, when you and I ask money to do something that only God can do, it leads to heartache and pain. So if you missed week one or week two, you can go onto our YouTube channel, you can go to our website, and you can catch up. And so you might be asking, why are we even doing a series called What Keeps You Up About Worry and Stress and Anxiety and Fear? And, and it's, we're not doing this series because it's my idea or it's an opinion. Matter of fact, research, research, the American Psychological Association says this. I'm going to put it up on the screen and read it to you. Says, Americans are struggling. Remember last week we said, listen, 72% of Americans feel more stressed. I mean, they're just, there's something keeping us up at night. Americans are struggling to balance work and home life to make, and to make time to engage in healthy behaviors with stress, not only taking a toll on their personal physical health. So listen, we talked about this in week one. When you and I worry, when you and I are stressed, when you and I are anxious, it hurts us physically, our health, but it also affects the emotional and physical well-being of our families. And so the reason that we're even in the series is, is that we have a struggle with stress and it's affecting the well-being of ourselves and those around us. And then here's something, listen, here's something that is really crazy. You probably kind of know this, but you haven't been able maybe to say it, but it's something that you know on the inside is, is that this is something that we all do. Listen, it doesn't matter whether you have no faith. It doesn't matter whether you have different faith. It doesn't matter whether you've been following Jesus. There's something that we all do to actually make this worse. I mean, could you, I mean, this is already hard enough. I mean, life is already hard enough as it is. I mean, we know this, the people tell us this, we experience this, but did you know that all of us do something to actually make this worse? Matter of fact, here's what the research on worry and stress and anxiety tells us, and it's going to be shocking, but it is no less true, and we're going to put it up on the screen. Did you know that nearly one third of what we worry about are things in the past that are unchangeable? <gasps> Like, listen, listen, come on, listen. Everyone smile. Everyone turn your neighbor and nod. Go, it's okay. Turn your neighbor and smile. Listen, did you know that nearly one third of all that you and I worry are about things that are unchangeable in the past? That we spend time and energy and emotions and all kinds of things worrying about things in the past. As a matter of fact, when you and I worry about the unchangeable past, it has another word for it, and it's called regret. Can you think, can you imagine that? Of all the things that we worry about, one third of them are about things that are unchangeable in 
our past. And here's how it happens. Listen, I know I've done this. I'm wondering if you've done this. I bet we've all done this. We're going along in life normal. Lolly, lolly, lolly. Maybe we're picking up our latte, right, from Starbucks. You know, they're called eight bucks now, right? It used to be four bucks. Now it's eight bucks, right? Maybe you're going through Starbucks. Maybe you're at work. Maybe with your friends. Maybe you're watching a T-show. But something happens. You're going through your day normally, lolly, lolly, right? And there's a sound. There's a song. There's, there's, there's an experience, there's a conversation, there's something that happens that creates all of a sudden you remember a failure. And I just want to raise a hand and listen, listen, I need everyone to participate. Listen, in Lesbia, I need you to participate, I need you to participate in Leonardtown, okay, we're all going to do the same time. If you've ever failed, like you, you knew it was wrong, you, you just, but you went ahead and did away. If you've ever failed, I want you to raise your hand. Everyone that's ever, raise your hand if you've ever failed. Now take a look around the room. See, you're not alone. And here's what happens is we're going through life, we're we remember a failure that we have and all of a sudden we start rehashing this failure in our mind and, and we're in the middle of whatever it is. We could be talking to our friends. We could be with our spouse. We could be at a party. We could be at work. Um, we could be eating a meal. Whatever it is, all of a sudden we remember this failure and all of a sudden we begin to relive it in our minds. And as we relive it in our minds, we're going, oh, if I just would have done this differently, if I would have just made this choice, if I wouldn't have just said those words, if I just hadn't had one more drink, if I just hadn't gone home with that, if I just hadn't done that, if I hadn't just gotten the car, if I had just said no, if I had just done it differently. And then all of a sudden, as we're thinking about our failures, we begin to think things and we say stuff like this. I can't believe how stupid I was. Has anyone, has anyone ever said, I can't believe how, how stupid I am? Have you ever said, listen, I can't believe I missed that. Oh my gosh. How, how did I miss that? Oh my gosh, no one will like me now. Everyone must know my failure. I'm a, how many of us after we think of that go, oh my gosh, I'm a failure. You know, I can't believe I did it. Oh, it'll never change. I'll always be a mess up. And as we relive these things in the past that are unchangeable, something happens that makes life now harder than it needs to be. I mean, think about it. We're in the middle of something that is going on and all of a sudden we become, whether it's at work, whether it's with our family, whether we're out and about, wherever we're at, we become distracted by the past. Not only do we become distracted by the past, we may miss out in the present because we're remembering something that happens in the past. Not only are we distracted and not only are we missing out on the present because we're thinking about the past, all of a sudden we're dredging up all these feelings in these emotions and all of a sudden we may have feelings of, of sadness sadness. We may have feelings of anger. We may have feelings of regret. And we're having all these feelings in a present moment that is not attached to anything that is happening right now. It happened in the past, but our feelings aren't reflective of the situation around us. And not only are we distracted and missing out, not only are we having emotions that aren't really connected to the very present, they're from the past, right? All of a sudden, we begin to doubt ourselves and others about things that might not actually even be true. We're just taking the past and overlaying it on the present. So so not only are we distracted, not only do we have emotions that aren't connected to the present, all of a sudden we may doubt ourselves and others on something that may or may not be true, right? So, so we doubt that. And then listen, our decision-making process, our decision-making process gets all whacked out. I mean, think about it. All of a sudden in the moment, as we're remembering the failures of the past, we start making decisions based on our past failures. And oftentimes that is a horrific way. And so you know what happens? In the midst of life and all of its busyness, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of it already being hard enough, you know what you and I do? I've done this. I'm just wondering if anyone else has ever done this. We take time. We take energy. We create extra stress. And we impede our decision or make our decision-making poor all to fix something that is... Oh, y'all, come on, come on, Leonard Town, help me out. It's for something that's all What? I mean, come on, think about it. You and I just spent time. We just spent energy. We just created stress in our hearts and our minds, right? And we just impeded our decision making all to try to do to fix something in the past that is unchangeable, and we didn't fix it. Matter of fact, there is no amount of worrying, there's no amount of regret that will ever, ever change something in the past. And it leads us to our opening truth this morning. If you're one of those type of people that like to follow in the bulletin, we're going to put on the screen. It leads us to the opening thing. Worrying about the past often robs us of creating the future we dream of. I mean, when you and I worry about the past that we can't change, it robs you and I of creating the future we dream of. 
I mean, think about it. We take time, we take energy, and we take emotions into rehashing the past that is impossible to change. When we could take that time, we could take that energy, we could take that emotion to try to create the future that we dream of. And so we're left going, listen, you know what, what do we do? I mean, I mean, worrying and regret, it just robs us. It just, we, we can't fix this. And, and so you know what we do? When we worry and we regret the past, it keeps you and I stuck. And you know what I know about being stuck? No one likes it. No one ever said, oh, Pastor Matt, I can't wait to be stuck. I can't wait to be stuck in my car. I can't wait to be stuck in a line. But that's exactly what happens when you and I get stuck about worrying about the past that's unchangeable. When you and I get kind of in this kind of negative thought loop about our past that we can't change, you and I get stuck. And when we're stuck, it is painful and is disappointing and it leads nowhere. And it leaves you and I asking a really, really important question. We, we know we're going to have failures. We know that we've had failures. So the real question is, how do we not get stuck worrying or having regret about the past? And it's an answer that each of us will need to have because all of us has failed. I asked everyone, everyone raise their hand. We all have failures from the past. We all have regrets from the past. How do we not get stuck wasting our time, our energy, our thought processes? on fixing something that can't be fixed instead of facing the future. Now, you might be like, man, this is a sad, depressing start to the message, but it's, it's gonna get better. But listen, here's good news. Listen, everyone, everyone does this, come on. Everyone smile, just smile, it's okay. You can smile, right? Here's why you can smile, is because you are not alone. Listen, each and every one of us has dealt with this. Matter of fact, every generation on every continent and every kind of culture has had to deal with this issue of worrying about the past, robbing us from our future. Listen, you and I are not the first people to deal with this, so that's good news. You are not alone, and the news gets better. This is why I woke up before my alarm this morning. Listen, listen, God knew that you and I would struggle with this. And God actually addresses this very issue. God addresses this very issue in one of the most surprising ways ever that is imaginable by you and I. And he does it in a way that lets you and I know some very important truths this morning. And so that you and I don't get stuck being unproductive and in pain and in disappointment, spending time, energy, and emotions on something that can't be changed, instead spending our time, our energy, and emotions on the future, on something that can be changed, God did something surprising. Now, before I get to the scripture, that, and the kind of the thing that, that shows what God did is surprising, I need to give you kind of a little bit of like history of the church. And so um, we're gonna stop here for a second and take a little bit of history of church. Um, God created everything. Humans messed it all up. The world was busted and broken. Man created something called religion, where it's we attempt to reach God. And God said, listen, you're missing it out. And so God reached out to man. That's the difference between Jesus and religion. Jesus showed up and he said, listen, if you want to see what God looks like, the he, I'm what he looks like. And so Jesus went about doing good. Jesus healed people. Jesus loved people, right? And then Jesus told his disciples, listen, I'm going to go and die for the sins of the world. And so Jesus didn't get put on a cross. Jesus allowed himself to be murdered on behalf of all of us broken people in humanity for all the past and for all the future sins. And so they put him up on a cross and they buried him in the tomb. And the great news, listen, I need you to understand something. Christianity is not a about a set of rules. It's about a person who conquered hell and death and his tomb is empty. Now here's the amazing thing. The reason that you and I are even here today has to do with who God chose to be one of his primary disciples to change kind of the European, the culture outside the Jewish culture. Because the disciple to carry the message to non-Jewish people wasn't Peter. Matter of fact, who God chose, who Jesus chose to share the message of the gospel wasn't even one of the original disciples. And I want to look at you, and, and I know that sometimes people come here because we have donut holes and good music and a funny-looking dude up front. Like, listen, I want to say here, if you're here and you have no faith or different faith, listen, one of the most amazing things about the faith of Jesus is that one of the primary disciples that carried the message of Jesus that wrote a third of the New Testament was an original disciple. This person actually encountered a risen Jesus. You probably know him as the the Apostle Paul, but the Apostle Paul actually was named Saul, and he wasn't a follower of Jesus, and the only reason he became a follower of Jesus is because he encountered a resurrected Jesus and began to share the gospel because he encountered a resurrected Jesus. But here's what's surprising about the Apostle Paul is the guy had a past. 
And not just any kind of laissez-faire pass, a pretty crazy pass. Matter of fact, we pick it up and we're going to put it up on the screen. And you can find it in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10. And here's what the Apostle Paul says. He wrote one third of the New Testament. He, he went on all these missionary trips. He went almost in the known world, shared the gospel. And here's what he says. He says, for I am the least of all of the apostles. But yet God used him magnificently. Matter of fact, he wasn't one of the original apostles. And maybe that's why he's saying I'm one of the least apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted God's church. But we're going to stay right here. We're going to stay right here. He said, because I persecuted God's church. Now here's Paul writing about himself. And like, have you ever told a story about yourself, but you don't tell the whole story because you don't want people to know how bad you really are? Come on, am I the only person? Have you ever told a story that kind of like, yeah, I messed up, but you don't share all the details because you don't want people to know how bad you really are, how bad you're like, am I the only one that ever does that? Like, here's Paul. He's Paul's telling his story. And he's saying, listen, I'm, I should be the least of the apostles. And here's the reason I don't even be deserved to be called apostle, because I persecuted the church. And what he's leaving out there, it means is he, he murdered innocent people. He was a murderer. Matter of fact, in Acts, when we see them stoning Stephen, whose only crime was feeding the widows and the poor, they laid their coats at this one named Paul, who becomes, I mean, Saul, who becomes Paul. Saul was a murderer, and he went and chased Christians and imprisoned them. So when he says, I persecuted the church, what he really meant was, is I was a person who killed innocent people and imprisoned innocent people. I destroyed families and destroyed lives. There's no way God would use a murderer and one who, who was hateful and destroyed families. He says, because I persecuted God's church, but, and I want to, before I go on the next thing, I just, I just want to, I want to stop here. I want everyone to look up here. See, I have a story. You have a story. We have a story. And I think someday our story could read like something like this. I don't deserve because, fill in the blank. I don't deserve because, because I stole from people, because I did horrible things because I was an, like, whatever your thing is, I don't deserve because. And for many of us, our story is defined by I don't deserve because. And this is so beautiful. We don't deserve. Let's go on. By God's grace, I am what I am. And that grace he gave me was not without effect. And this is, might be one of the most beautiful verses in all the Bible. He says, by God's grace. Listen, I, this, is, this is so awesome. He doesn't say by God's religion. He doesn't say by God's politics. He doesn't say by God's, like God's, these things that you have, these hoops that you have to jump through, the party that you vote for, the money you have, the color the, of your skin, the language you speak, the cotton you're born on. It's by God's that's, you know what grace is? Is that you can't earn it. You didn't deserve it. God gave it freely. Grace is free to us because Jesus paid the price. By God's grace, I am what I am. And here's what I love about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul doesn't try to hide who he really is. He said, I persecuted the church. I am what I am. And I love that because that frees me up and it should free you up and it should free us to not to pretend to be religious people that we aren't, to be the human beings that we really are in front of people and to go, listen, I am what I am, but by God's grace. Could you imagine if the church got a hold of this? Instead of pretending to be something we weren't, we were just normal everyday people who needed Jesus and we're all equal at the foot of the cross and wherever we're at, we're there by God's grace. And it says his grace was without effect. You, really? I mean, he became the Apostle Paul who went on a church planting spree that planted churches all across the known world. He wrote a third of the New Testament. Most historian scholars say he's the second most important man in history because he spread the news of Jesus to the parts of the world that would have never heard about Jesus had he not become a missionary. And here's what's amazing. God gave a destiny to someone whose past didn't deserve it because of God's. So listen, when you and I get stuck worrying about the past, 
When you and I get stuck in that regret thought loop, when we start with one failure and then we go to the next failure and then we go to the next failure and we begin to believe lies that, lies that says something like this, God could never use a person like, let's try, God could never use a person like, we need to be reminded of some truths that God used a murderer. God used someone who, who imprisoned people and destroyed families, not because he earned it, not because he deserved it. It was by God's grace, and his grace was not without effect. Which leads me to say some three brief things this morning so that when you and I are reminded of our failures, you and I can begin to repeat these truths from God. And here's the first one if you're following along in your set. Grace means that we are not defined by our failures. Amen! Is no one else fired up about that? Maybe it's just me. I have tons of failures. So I'm really glad that I'm not defined by my failures. Now, come on, come on. Here, here, here's the thing. Listen, God's grace has the power to change your story. And my story. And our story. Grace has the power to undo whatever it was in the past. Listen, you can't go back and, and change the past. But wherever you're at now, your story can have a different ending. Your past, the middle of your story, the beginning of your story doesn't have to define you because of God's grace. Listen, you and I aren't defined by what we do. We're defined by who loves us. See, this is what's so amazing about grace is there's a God in heaven who looks down and sees us as sons and daughters. Matter of fact, I love what the scripture says. We're going to put it up on the screen about grace. And it's in 1 John 2, and he says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you won't sin. And listen, listen, here, here's the thing. Come on, we just need to stop. We just need, can we have an adult conversation? Listen, listen, we think God's in heaven going, Oh, don't sin because, ah, I can't take it. God doesn't want us to sin because it impacts him. God doesn't want us to sin because it ruins our lives. Sin is like poison that we drink thinking it's going to help us. Instead, it harms us. God doesn't want us to not sin because he doesn't want us to have fun. God doesn't want us to sin because it destroys our lives. It destroys others. And if you don't believe me, just watch the news. We live in a busted and broken world. My dear children, I write this so that you won't hurt yourselves and hurt others. But if anyone does sin, if we mess up, if we knowingly choose to do wrong and hurt ourselves, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice. You know what that means? You can't earn it. I can't deserve it. We can't work for it. We don't obey God to get into heaven. We don't give money to get into heaven. We don't come to church to go to heaven. We don't vote for the right politics or whatever to get into heaven. We get in heaven because of what Jesus did, Jesus' sacrifice. And not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. And some of you need to hear this. Because some of us in this room, we've done some bad things. And listen, there are things I'll never say in public or to any other people that I did when I was younger because I did horrific things. Short of murder, I probably committed almost every crime that there was. And so I just want you to know, when I say this, I'm not saying this as someone who's never messed up. But I love what it says in Psalms. It says this, it says, it says, He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. That means He took our sins and they, He's removed them. East and West never meet. And there's great news. For any of us here today that have something from our past that we regret, if we have something that goes, I, I failed, I epically messed it up, I knew it was wrong, I chose it anyway, and now I just, I know I failed God. Great news, there is forgiveness, not in a pastor, not in a country, not in a church, but in a person named Jesus. And grace has the power to change your story. And listen, you're probably thinking what I was thinking because I remember the first time I heard this. You know the first time I heard this? It was 32 years ago. I was freshly out of juvie. And I went to a church just like this. It met in a high school. And it was set up every week by volunteers. And I remember sitting in the audience Hearing that there was a God who made me and a God who loved me and a God who would remove my sins. The God who saw everything that I did and yet would still forgive me, would remove my sins as far as his east is from west. And I remember sitting in a church thinking what some of you were thinking. 
God could never ever use someone broken like me. And then I began to pray just the most dangerous prayer. God, would you use someone like me? And his grace stepped into my story and my life has never ever been the same. And some of you are sitting here in this room and here's what you're thinking. You're thinking God couldn't use someone like me. God's grace is good for someone like Paul, but what about someone like me? And I'm here to tell you today, if God's grace can change my story, I believe that God's grace can change any story and he can change your story if you let him. You are not defined by your failures. You're defined by the one who loves you, who died to remove your sins. So no matter what your past failures, no matter what your past sins are, you are not your failures and you are not your faults and you are not your mistakes. You are a son or daughter of the most high that God gave his one and only son for. And it gets better. Which leads me straight into the second observation, which is this. Grace means we're not defriended by our mistakes. Listen, I can't tell you the number of people who go, I love Jesus. I've, I've read about Jesus. I'm not necessarily into religion. I'm not necessarily into church stuff. But this Jesus guy, like I would follow Jesus. But you know, I don't know if I could follow Jesus. And the reason I don't know if I could follow Jesus is because I, have you met me? Like, I'm a mistake waiting to happen. Like, like I want to follow Jesus. I want to be in. I want to love God. But if I was really honest, I know me. And I know as soon as I start to follow, man, like I'm going to cuss. I'm going to like cheat. I'm going to like do that. Like I'm going to mess it up. And so like God will just be disappointed in me. And here's the great thing is, listen, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God found in Jesus. The great news is, is when you say yes to Jesus, he has forgiven you not just of all your past sins, but all your Somebody ought to be fired up about that. I'm fired up about that because I, like, I just make mistakes. I just do it all the time. I don't mean to. I don't try to. But I do, and I'm in desperate needs of God's grace. And I love what the Scripture says. This, listen, God doesn't defriend us because we made mistakes. Here's what the Scripture says, and I love it in 1 John 1, 8-9. It says, if we have no sins, we are only... Come on, come on, man. Like Every one of us knows when we go to bed <laughs> who we really are. And you can say, like, I don't mess up, and I'm, I'm good, and I'm perfect. But the reality is, is, like, if we say that we haven't messed up, we're just, we're only fooling ourselves, and we're refusing to accept the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he can be dependent on to forgive us and cleanse us from, what's that word? Every wrong. Listen, there is no sin that the blood of Jesus can't forgive if you come and confess and turn and repent. Every sin. There's no sin. Every wrong. It says that he can be depended upon. He is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins. And it goes on to say this, and it is perfectly proper for God to do this because Christ died. If he didn't want to wash away our sins, why would Christ die? And so listen, here's great news. Whatever it is that we did that we regret, whatever it is that we did that we go, oh, how could I be stupid or oh, it'll never change. Great news. Just confess it to God. Just tell God the truth. Here's the most amazing thing. He already knows. <laughs> like, come on. Like, he already knows. He already knows that we did it. He already saw. He already knows where our heart is. And see, here's the thing. Here's the thing is like, listen, and I remember when I was a young follower of Jesus, like that whenever I would like struggle with stuff, struggle with temptation or sin or lust or greed or envy or strife or addiction, Right? If I would struggle with any of these things, I would tend to avoid God and not pray because I'd go, oh, he, he's going to hate me because like, I've done these wrong things and I'm thinking these wrong thoughts. And here's what I discovered. That's the exact opposite. We need to run to God because that's when we need him the most. And so wherever it is your failure is, you can run to God because he forgives you. Now, Jesus speaks to something else, and this is pretty important. We're going to see it in the gospel. We're going to put it up on the screen, Matthew 5, 23 through 24. And it says, if you are standing before the altar of the temple, so he says, I'm going to break this down just in case anybody wants to know what that means. He says, if you're at church, just, if you're at church, or if you're trying to play church, or if you're trying to be church, if you just think you're a follower of Jesus and, and you go, oh, I'm a Christian, and you're offering a sacrifice to God, you're like in your car listening to your Christian music, and you got your WWJD slapped on the back of your bumper sticker, you should drive and not flip people off. And suddenly remember that a friend has something against you. What does it say? Leave your sacrifice before the altar. Go and... Man, look, at you said that word and you did not die. If you go and apologize and be reconciled to him and then come offer. See, here's something that Jesus says. Jesus gives us grace for our past failures. 
But then Jesus gives us some grace for the present failures that we're going to experience. And here's the grace in our present failures is that we confess our sins to God and then we apologize to people that we've wronged and we make amends. Let me put it this way, because this is so important. What does God's grace look like in everyday life? I'm going to put it up right here on the screen. I want you to hear this. Saying, saying, and making amends is God's grace today, so tomorrow won't be hindered by regret. If you want to get off the regret train, if you want to get off the worrying path train, we have to learn how to say sorry, and we have to learn how to make amends. True story because I'm a moron and I'll put my foot in my mouth at the first chance. I was with a good friend. My good friend was having somewhat of a bad day. My, my good friend had, had made somewhat of a mistake. And we were, and there's a group of us talking. And, and this friend of mine said something like this. My friend said, yeah, I'm just a jerk. And so I was trying to encourage my friend. And I didn't think about the words that came out of my mouth because that's what happens with me sometimes. Right? So I go, oh, you're not a jerk. You're just you being you. And they looked at me, and then all the other people in the room who were with me just turned and looked at me. And then I realized as soon as the words came out of my mouth that I had just met, like, that was not helpful. Like, I just, I, I just messed it up. And so I had to apologize. I had to say, I'm sorry. And then every once in a while, when I'm around that person, I'll repeat that thing. Hey, listen, I just want to be your friend. I don't really mean to be a jerk. That's just who I am, right? I kind of say sorry and I make amends and I'm telling you, listen, as a follower of Jesus, one of the greatest things I've learned to not be hindered by regret is grace today that when I mess up, I apologize to my kids, even when I get it wrong. Just because they're young doesn't mean they're stupid. As parents, listen, parents, this is some of the best advice I can give you. Kids need to learn how to, when they get it wrong, make it right. And if we pretend like we're always right and never wrong in front of our kids, our kids will never learn that when they're wrong, how to make it right. So as parents, when we get it wrong, we should apologize. We should say, I'm sorry. We should figure out a way to make it right. When we, we offend our spouse and when we offend our neighbor, when we get it wrong, all we have to do is say, just go, I blew it. Don't make an excuse. Just go, I, I was wrong. I'm a moron. You know, I've discovered when I said I'm wrong and I'm wrong, most people look at me and go, yep, that's true. I forgive you. And they go on. Because I'm not trying to give them, I'm not trying to give them some excuse. I'm not trying to say it's not my fault. I'm not trying to say it's their fault. I just go, no, I'm just busted and broken. They go, yeah, me too. Okay, I get it. I'll forgive you today because tomorrow you're probably going to need to forgive me. And I go, great. That's a great Leo. We should do that. And then make amends. That's why Jesus tells us when you're playing church and you realize that you've done something wrong to somebody else and you're in conflict, you need to say you're sorry and you need to make amends. Because it's grace for today that hinders us from regret in the future. It's God's grace today. Which leads me to my third point as the timer's telling me I'm done. Grace means our future isn't determined by our faults. I remember sitting in a church like this, hearing the story of Jesus. And I always thought, man, like I would love to be used by God, but I'm broken. You see, I I have this pattern and it's been my whole life is, I'm a pretty passion intense person. If you you haven't picked that up yet, like I'm passion intense. And so uh, my passion and my intensity seem to get me in trouble all the time. I open my mouth, I speak before I think. I, I, when I play sports, I'm just, I cuss and I'm bad. Don't ever, that's why I don't play on the church softball team because I love Jesus. And you know, I just, like my passion and my intensity are, are just like this thing that always get me in trouble. And I go, I can't serve God because this thing, the way I'm made is just busted and broken. And here's what I discovered is God doesn't want robots. God wants to redre- redirect Whatever this thing is that busted is and broken and redirected in a positive light. And so what I discovered is God didn't want to kill my passion and my intensity. God wanted to turn my passion and intensity in the right direction. And here's what you know and here's what I know and here's what the world knows. Usually our greatest weakness is our greatest strength, right? Our greatest weakness is often our greatest strength. And God doesn't want to kill it and make you a robot. God just wants to redirect whatever it is that keeps causing you to be broken into an area that is good and that is right and will make the world a better place. And here's what I need you to know is God doesn't want me to be the hero. Because that's what people in church think. Pastor, you do it and I get to be on the sideline. I get to be in the stands. We get to be the audience that cheers you on. But as followers of Jesus, my job is to make you the hero in God's story. I mean, do you understand that? That's your past and your flaws doesn't mean your future is determined by them. You know how I know? Because the scripture tells us, we're going to look at what it says in Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 10. For it is by, what's that word? 
It is grace. Listen, this is the greatest news ever. You and I don't get into heaven because we earned it. It's because of what Jesus did. You've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. None of us get to say we made it to heaven because we were born in America or, or because I went to church or because I read the right kind of Bible. We get to be with our Heavenly Father because of what Jesus did. Period. We good? All right, next part. For we are God's. No one ever told me that before. But I walked into a church that shared a scripture like this that said, you are God's handiwork. Maybe things have been done to you and maybe you did things to make you feel like you are not God's handiwork, but that doesn't take away that the image of God is something that you bear. You are God's handiwork. You were created in Christ Jesus to do good works where God had prepared in advance for you to do. You are to be a hero in God's story called history. I mean, think about it. Moses was 80 years old before he went to lead Israel. David had slept with Bathsheba and committed murder, yet God still used him. God used Peter after he denied him three times. God used doubting Thomas after he had doubted the risen Christ. God used the disciples after they had abandoned him and fled and denied him. God used Paul who had been a murderer. God uses broken people because his grace has the power to change my story and your story and our story so that we become heroes in his story. And which leads me to the kind of like, what's the main point? Can you just close it up? It's hot in here. And here's what it is. Regret changes us to the past. When you and I worry about the unchangeable, it changes us to the past while grace frees us for the future. Told you I was going to end with this. This is a license plate that I had made when I got my first or second car. I can't remember which. And I wrote set free because there's a verse that says this, and it's Jesus. He's being quoted. Jesus says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And because of my past and because of my faults and because sometimes I'm a moron more often than I ever want to be, I got this license plate that said set free to remind me that I am not my failures. And when people would ask me, oh, what, is your, what does your license plate mean? I go, oh, it means I'm set free, literally and spiritually. I used to be someone who was locked up and incarcerated and an addict, and I did a bunch of bad things, but I met a person named Jesus, and he set me free. And then people would be like, oh. I'm like, do you want to know Jesus? And they'd, just, they'd usually run in the other direction. <laughs> Jesus set us free. Why are we spending time worrying on things that we can't change? Why, are, why do we have guilt and shame on something that Jesus doesn't even remember? He's, he's taken our sin and he's separated as far as the east from west. And here's the most amazing thing about being set free, whom the Son sets free, is there's no story too broken. There's no story too hard. There's no story too bad that the grace of God can't come in and change. And if you want to be set free, all you have to do is know Jesus and follow him. And he will make you a hero in his story. Something we call history. His grace frees us from the past so that you and I don't have to spend time worrying. We don't have to spend time on regrets. I love what the Apostle Paul says, and I'm going to close with this. He says, no, dear friends, I am still not all I should be. He says, listen, I'm not the man I want to be yet. I'm not, and if you're here and you're a lady, I'm not the lady I want to be yet. None of us are the, all of the person that we want to be, are we? We could all be better, do better, be, be more, right? He says, listen, I'm not all that I should be. But I'm bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing. I am going to forget the, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. And I want to encourage you in Jesus to say sorry where you need to say you're sorry and to make amends where you need to make amends. But we need to put the past behind us and allow Jesus to create the future that he has for us. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that we're not defined by our faults or our failures. That our sins are separated far as this east is from west. God, thank you that you give us grace today. 
to learn how to say we're sorry and how to make amends so that we don't have to be hindered by regret later, that there's grace in this moment in the present so that we don't have to be bound by the chains of regret. God, thank you that our faults don't determine our destiny. God, that you created this, this destiny, good works and stuff for us to do in Christ Jesus before we were even born. God, that there is no story too hard and that there is wonder-working power found in the blood of Jesus to change our story. We look to you. God, we don't look to a church. We don't look to a pastor. We don't look to a country. We look to a person named Jesus who's washed away our sin, who's called us sons and daughters, and who's called us something greater. So God, we give it up. We let go. And we're going to ask you to help us create the future that you have for us and that you died for. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.